Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hyperledger Foundation Healthcare Special Interest Group General Meeting. Today is June 8th. This meeting is recorded, uh, and I just wanted to welcome you all. Thank you for joining. Uh, this, If you do speak and you want to say something, please just be aware this, is, this will be a public video uh, and shared online. Um, so... Without any further ado, I would like to welcome any new members, if they would like to introduce themselves to the community, share maybe who they are, what they do, and why they're interested in this. James, would you like to go first? Absolutely. Good morning. My name is James Davis. I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm faculty at Louisiana State University. I, I teach technology classes in the business school. Uh, I am indeed interested in blockchain for any number of reason, reasons to include bringing that technologies into the classroom. Uh, I also do some consulting with Louisiana Department of Health, and I've also been involved for the past year and a half with some uh, mining operations with a, uh, with a group that I joined up with and helped start. So uh, I'm just interested with blockchain all around. Awesome. Thank you, James. Appreciate it. Hi, James. This is Mindy Charles. I'd love to connect with you offline. I also teach uh, health information technology at, well, I teach at the University of Colorado Denver, and I serve on a committee for the Colorado Department of Higher Education to determine how best to teach blockchain as a curriculum in Colorado. So yeah, let's connect offline, and I'm happy to share anything that might be helpful to you. Love Denver, love your school, would love to connect. Great. Okay. I'll put my con uh, contact information in the chat for you. Thank you. Awesome. And for those that may not know me, I'm the chair of the special interest group. I actually just was elected chair very recently, only a couple months ago. Uh, and yeah, and this is what this group is all about, this networking, learning new things, connecting with each other. I think that's really important. So Wendy, thanks for reaching out like that. Um, People come and go, members, there's many members, not all of them come to this meeting. Some of them watch the webinar later, uh, but I think it's just important that we continue these relationships with each other because that's how we'll, we're all gonna learn and grow. So thank you all. Um, anybody else wanna introduce themselves? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and just get started and digging into some of the upcoming events, and then we'll go into the news articles. So this week in Austin, Texas, Coindesk is hosting the Festival of the Decentralized World. It's a consensus 2022 conference. Uh, it'll be pretty big, I think. Um, there's a few specific events happening during that conference as well. Um, the Block Damon and Floating Point Group is hosting a networking and games event. You can register here. There's a password to register. It's Lebowski. And on June 10th, Health 3.0, How Decentralization Will Reinvent Healthcare event is also another good event you guys should check out if you're in the area. Um, and again, there's an event in Chicago, June 19th through the 23rd for the Drug Information Association Global Conference Annual Meeting. Um, and then there's one in Stanford, August 29th to the 31st. I'm sure there's many other events. These are the ones I have here. If there's some events you would like to, you know, you would like to highlight, I'd be happy to include them here too. Yes, um, this is Wendy. If I can uh, make the group aware of another event coming up this week, uh, the Blockchain Technology Summit is uh, produced through Canadian universities. It goes through, I believe, today through Saturday. And I will be uh, Thursday, let me back up. On Thursday, I will be speaking, uh, it's a health day, and I'll be speaking about blockchain-based dynamic consent. If you would like to join, it's virtual and admission is really inexpensive. I think it's like $25, 25 to $40, but they, they've lined up some fantastic speakers. And I, I think it's just a great opportunity to expand our knowledge, especially when we realize that blockchain is an international community and it's fantastic opportunity to hear what other organizations around the world are working on. So hope you can join us. Thanks, Wendy. I'll put a link uh, in the chat. Perfect. That'd be great. Uh, and Ray, I just need to, to mention, so there's um, two events coming up for Pharma Ledger. 
One of them is an open consultation, which is going to be held with the European Patients Forum and the European Forum of Good Clinical Practice, and that's going to be over in Brussels. And then straight after that, uh, Pharma Ledger is going to be, well, I'm going to be moderating a panel at the European Blockchain Convention uh, in, in Barcelona. So happy to share those uh, kind of event details and, and logins and, and things like that as well. Awesome. Thank you, Wendy and Kirit. And if you guys do have access to the agenda and you're, you're willing to do it, you can comment your links directly in the agenda page. This way it'll be there for others to see later. Um, I'll put the link in the chat again, just so you have access, but that's, that's awesome. And Pharma Ledger is doing a lot of really important work. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Any other announcements or events people want to highlight? Okay. Awesome. So I did find a few articles in the last couple of weeks that were interesting. First one here is from Andreessen Horowitz. And I thought this was pretty interesting because it specifically highlights the healthcare fintech intersection and they call these um, pay providers. So provider groups are really health systems or providers that are also acting as um, insurance companies or fintech companies in some ways. So they break it up into many different services. Uh, the fintech components of a pay provider, it includes insurance products, platform services, care delivery services. And when you look at this really awesome chart here, you can see the different companies that are part of this pay provider, um, I guess, ecosystem or group. So I'm sure you've recognized, you can recognize a few names here, like, you know, Oscar's big one, um, some other startups, Level, uh, Firefly Health, you know, there's a bunch of companies here that you might recognize, but they're all pretty, I guess, new, they're relatively new startups. So it's interesting to see how they break out insurance platform services here into, you know, Medicare, Medicaid plans, they talk about over the counter supplement benefits, um, individual market plans. So different companies are really focusing on these specific services and not trying to do um, everything, I guess. So that's, I thought it was pretty interesting. Any, anyone read this article or find it interesting? I haven't read it, but uh, I will. How did, how do they situate these new entrants, I guess, or smaller entrants with the mega players, you know, Kaiser Permanente is back most every, not all, but many of the large health systems now are aligning themselves with payer organizations, you know, from Memorial, Hermann, Rush, et cetera. You know, the big, most of the big hospital systems now, and many of them are aligning with payers. And then you got the classic HMOs. Where do they fit in this? Right, yeah. And those major players, it doesn't look like they're in here, um, but you're right, they are doing that. And also I heard Ascension, which is I think one of the biggest health systems, they have like a billion dollar venture fund too now. So they're acting as investors as well. So, you know, it's pretty interesting to see how it's evolving. Um, we'll continue yeah. to watch it. United Health Group, for example, I mean, the largest oh, yeah. and the largest provider in America. So where did they seem to, I don't know, I'm just curious of how they position these new entrants relative to the giants. Yeah, in the article, it does mention some of the big players for comparing them, but I don't, it didn't go into too much detail about that, I think. Um, so non-healthcare fintech products can teach us numerous other lessons. Okay, so they talk about how existing fintech companies, one fintech company, Plaid, which you may know, um, has been doing really well. So they're comparing, you know, these companies to Plaid for healthcare, very focused, making it easier for data sharing, interoperability. Um, well, maybe it's just, um, uh, Andreessen Horowitz is only interested in, you know, early stage because it's the business they're in. <laughs> I don't know. 
That's fair. That's true too. Um, and you know, one thing that really got me is this portable healthcare coverage. I do think this is a, a big gap in our system. You know, for those age 28 to 34, the medium median employment tenure is 2.8 years. And after that, you know, you have to switch your insurance with your new employer, for example. And that does seem a little bit like a broken way to handle healthcare, at least in the United States. Um, so yeah, I think there's companies working on that too. Yeah. Interesting to keep uh, track of these companies, I would think. I'm going to move on. And one of the quotes I picked out of that article is the primary battle between every startup and incumbent is whether the startup gets distribution before the incumbent gets innovation. I think that's so true because like you mentioned, you know, United Health Group and um, Kaiser, these are the incumbents, but they can innovate too. It's not like they can't. So if they are able to mimic some of the, you know, services or use cases that these fintech companies have, then it's going to be really hard for those fintech startups to get any distribution or attraction with customers and users. So next up here is a nature article I saw on. <clears throat> and one thing to mention, there were no blockchain specific companies in this article, which I thought was kind of a little surprising, unless I missed it. But um, yeah, maybe next time. <laughs> This article came out in May is about how artificial intelligence is breaking patent law. So the patent system assumes that inventors are human. Inventions devised by machines require their own IP law and international treaty. So we don't have that. And I think that's something that we're realizing is AI can create new, new algorithms, perhaps new drug molecules uh, that can design different inventions really and we don't have a way of handling or managing that <laughs> so um this is one of the biggest threats patent systems has faced so i think it's really interesting to watch this because in the blockchain community there are many companies or really sometimes even DAOs that are trying to develop ip nfts for example so being able to uniquely identify the owner of an IP um, using NFTs. And now this brings the question, will AI be able to acquire or generate their own NFT patents in the future? And how will that even work? Um, so more questions than answers, I suppose. But I think this article really captures the idea of, you know, how AI will be able to create inventions and what are we going to do you know so what is patentable so yeah they have a lot of examples in here they talk about you know tinkering with existing legal protections risks leaving gray areas so more comprehensive law reform is preferable so um, an ideal solution would be for governments to design a bespoke form of ip known as su generous law sui generous law um, such custom built laws are designed to cover types of creative output not addressed by the big four ip doctrines of copyright industrial designs trademarks and patents they already incentivize and protect investment in circuit layouts new varieties of plants and in some jurisdictions databases any comments or thoughts on this anyone from the ai space Okay, moving on. So Coindesk had an article and I just thought this was interesting because many of us might have tried or had Chipotle, but the restaurant, the Tex-Mex chain restaurant is allowing cryptocurrencies to be used as payment. Um, actually 98 different digital currencies. So Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana included, and they're using the payments platform Flexa to do that. So just another example of crypto adoption. 
I haven't myself purchased a burrito and any kind of crypto yet, but uh, that might be something I might do uh, sometime soon. Ray, Ray, another thing I saw today is that mm. PayPal, PayPal has, has enabled the capability to take Bitcoin off its platform. And I think you're going to see maybe Revolut doing the same thing. So I think it's good for the ecosystem, but 10 years down the line, I don't want to be t paying 10,000 pounds for a burrito, if you know what I mean. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. But yeah, that's a really good example you bring up. PayPal for a while was not allowing their users to move their own crypto out of their PayPal accounts. Um, but now they are allowing them to do that. So it's good move for everybody. Um, but yeah, like, do I want to spend Bitcoin, especially now? Cynic would say burrito? You that burrito for a nickel. Yeah. That's true. It, it won't taste the same, Ray. It won't taste the same. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Thanks, guys. Next up here is an article from uh, Cointelegraph. It says, how crypto volatility affects mental health. Um, and, excuse me, did I stop sharing? Let me share again. Here we go. Okay, so I thought this was interesting too because we are seeing volatility. I'm sure a lot of uh, people, investors who, you know, put everything into crypto might be feeling kind of stressed out, depressed even. So they talk about, you know, some of the issues that we're seeing mental health now. And it's pretty interesting because, you know, this is a healthcare special interest group. So I think talking about mental health is, is important too here. So... Uh, they talk about how some investors make specific mistakes. Even when equipped with investment knowledge, beginners can make bad decisions under emotional pressure. In addition to technical and fundamental analysis, the right mental attitude plays an important role in trading. Under the pressure of emotions, rash acts can be committed, which usually cause mistakes and serious losses. These mistakes can be divided into several groups. I think I'm just going to highlight these because I think some of us might resonate, maybe not or we might know somebody who's, who uh, might resonate with these different groups. So first is the, gamble, uh, the gambler syndrome. And new investors begin to open a large number of transactions without thinking them through. Premature exit from a deal. At the first successful transaction, beginners tend to quickly take profits and close the position prematurely. In this case, they can lose part of the profits that they are in this case, they lose part of the profits that they could gain. Dependence on other market participants. Many traders are guided by the signals and opinions of established market participants. That's for sure. Uh, to obtain the maximum benefit, however, it is necessary to become independent of these factors. Coming to, these, coming to terms with losses, the cryptocurrency market is very susceptible to emotional trends. Prices immediately react to a variety of statements and rumors. So it won't be possible to get to completely get rid of the influence of emotions. And if you ever use Twitter, that's totally true. Euphoria from the first deal. The first profit gives the trader a positive emotion, which can only push them to be undisciplined. That's fair. Um, have any of you experienced any of these in any way? And if you have, maybe, uh, you know, try to diversify yourself a little bit in your investments. I think that's important. Number one, number one rule for investing is diversification. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, especially cryptocurrencies. Um, but yeah, they, they talk about the seriousness of this issue. And if you need help, seek help if you could. Any thoughts on this from anyone? Okay. They're going through these pretty quickly. That's good. Uh, so next up here that I had on my list was a Hacker Noon article titled How the Metaverse Can Transform Radical, or sorry, How the Metaverse Can Transform Traditional Industries and Improve Them. And they talk about the healthcare revolution. This was published last week. Um, so for sure, there's a lot of buzz about metaverse and blockchain. They go into sort of defining the metaverse, which is helpful for any academic person as well as industry person, because the definition 
is dynamic as well as the definition of web three, I think is also pretty dynamic. Um, but they do a pretty good job here. They talk about, you know, virtual and augmented reality, the digital infrastructure of web three and, you know, data ownership. Um, they talk about D health's, uh, decentralized health token, which puts the control in patients' hands and incentivizes them to make better, healthier choices. Of course, this is in theory, right? Uh, we know that. And this happens through the ability to monetize their medical assets, their health data, and future health activities, which is an excellent motivator for becoming an engaged and active participant in their health journey. So yeah, this is a pretty good article. I think easy to share this with people who are getting into the space and trying to understand how blockchain or the metaverse can impact healthcare. So um, if you haven't read it, I encourage you to do that and maybe share it with some of your, your colleagues as well. And if you didn't know, Hacker Noon has a Web3 writing competition. Uh, so if you're interested in writing, that's another opportunity there for you. Okay. Healthcare IT news. And I'm sure you've seen this in other places, but Oracle has completed its acquisition of Cerner. So this article is a bit old. There's actually an update to it that has been completed. All the necessary antitrust review has been, you know, all done and approved. So for $28 billion, Oracle now owns Cerner. I think this is a huge deal because I think Cerner is like number two or three in the marketplace for electronic medical records. So they're a, you know, a big player. Now that Oracle is major owner of Cerner, we'll see what happens. One thing I read in the article here is they are focusing or they intend to focus on using their voice enabled AI technology to make that the primary interface for EMRs or for their EMR system for Cerner. I, I don't know if that's such a good idea. It seems to me like using voice as the primary input would be quite challenging in a hospital setting, um, especially if it doesn't work that well. But, you know, any opinions from the group here on how this might I'm I'm with you, Ray. Uh, this is Jordan. Um, I I I've a lot of tech entrepreneurs I talk to really like this idea, and they really think this is where EHRs are headed. Um, but all the doctors I talk to kind of complain about it. Um, I mean, if any of you use like a an Alexa, you know, and you ask for directions or something, and it starts telling you about the weather, you can't have stuff like that happening as a doctor while you're treating a patient. I think the technology for voice assistant in, in this particular way has a ways to go before it will be really effective in that clinical environment. There's, there's some places where it probably would work better than others as well, but a broadly applied, you know, uh, dictation style interaction with the EHR, I'm, I'm guessing right now will not be well received by doctors. I think this is Alicia. I think that um, <laughs> I, agree with you. And like, for example, for me that I have an accent, they, it's, it's unreal how the translations or what, you know, what they're saying comes about. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I don't think that they're there yet. Well, the other thing I'd take in, if I were the, you know, from the amateur peanut gallery commentary is that um, Microsoft's nuance is, uh, far ahead in this area. Um, so if there is an opportunity, notwithstanding the comments just made about the resistance to acceptance in the you know, professional community, uh, if I were, I would guess I would short the, <laughs> the Oracle. Um, I mean, it, Microsoft will end up winning most of that business, I would imagine. If there's however much there really is. I mean, even with dictation, most of the uh, 
medical records that I have read, um, they're not accurate. Mm. So I cannot even imagine with boys. Yeah. Yeah, but Microsoft, I was referring to the acquisition of Nuance, which is the kind of almost undisputed industry leader in this space. So we'll see. As a biomedical engineer, I'd say the less you talk, the less germs you spread. <laughs> That's a good point, too. Yeah, I don't see this being used as, you know, at least initially not the primary mode of input for EHRs. It just wouldn't make sense to me. That would be really difficult, but maybe for specific use cases or specific types of patients in, I don't know, probably not the ER because in the ER, your emergency room, you're quickly trying to get things in and you're not going to wait for a dictation system to confirm the accuracy of your words. Um, but maybe in some settings it could work. And, and Doug, I guess this is the, uh, acquisition you're referring to microsoft completes acquisition of nuance ushering in a new era of outcomes based ai so thanks for mentioning that ray i would, I would say too there's um, we should be careful not to be uh too pes it's easy to be pessimistic right mm -hmm. about new technologies and things and and it's you know a lot of people were pessimistic about the internet and whether e-commerce would ever become a thing and boy were they wrong right so i mean it's possible here that maybe the technology improves in ways that we can't imagine. And one day it does become that primary mode of interaction with EHR, which if, if that were possible and they could distinguish between, you know, accents and languages and commotion and noise and, and have a really high rate, you know, accuracy, um, that would be amazing. Right. And so may, maybe in the future, if it improves, if the technology gets good enough, maybe it could be, but I think yeah, right, right now, I, I don't think we're there. I agree with you. I think that, eventually we'll get there. There is no question about it. I mean, the, the, the technology is there and it's getting better every time. So we'll get there, but they're not there yet. Yeah, I love the optimism. I think you guys are right. I mean, we are in a blockchain healthcare meeting right now. So I think we're all kind of optimists uh -huh. in general. So, and I think maybe like this, you know, combination of voice and maybe touch screen to confirm what you said, the accuracy, maybe what will happen is you'll say something, it'll give you three different options of what it thinks you said, and then you quickly choose one of them. So you don't have to repeat yourself. It, it gives you options. There's many ways to do it. And, and you're right. We don't know exactly how it's going to look, but there is a event, a virtual live event from Oracle June 9th, actually tomorrow. So you can go to this article and, and link here and you can sign up and anyone can attend. So they're going to be talking about this, the future of healthcare, Oracle Live. So it'll be interesting to see what they mentioned there. All right. Thanks for that engagement all. Appreciate it. Um, there's another article here. Was there anything else on that specifically? Uh, the voice in Oracle, the acquisition of Cerner? Cool. Okay. So the next article here, what big pharma really thinks about digital health. And I thought this was an interesting read. Um, this is from Dr. Leslie Ann Fent, and I believe she's in a pharma company. Um, when I told my colleagues midway through my rather standard pharma career that I would move laterally into our emerging digital health function to a role remit and structure that was yet to be defined, I encountered a lot of well-meaning skepticism. And if any of you have been in the pharma industry, you might, you know, feel that as well. Um, but, you know, it talks about the different myths about pharma. So myth one, so much investment, so little to show for it. Most large pharma companies have already invested significantly into digital health. I think that's true. And yet few efforts end up being or having a tangible impact for patients at scale. And it talks about it's not because they're not trying. They are trying. And there's plenty of proof of concepts, early stage solutions. Many companies get to that point. But then the tricky part is scaling it, turning it into a production environment, um, and then making it successful that way. And I think 
or what the article was saying is that pharma companies don't realize the amount of effort it, it takes to to scale their solutions or their proof of concepts to a functional state. Um, so that's the first myth. Second is there are so many solutions out there already. Can we just not leverage those? So sure, there are lots of solutions. Um, it's important to distinguish wellness or engagement solutions, which are ubiquitous from regulated medical grade digital products. So which are known as software as a medical device or SAMDs. <clears throat> um, you know, it talks about creating and scaling innovative co consumer technology is a challenge in itself. But when we, once we enter the arena of digital medical devices, the endeavor becomes 10 to 100 times more complex and expensive. Uh, recommends that big pharma can and should look to partner externally where quality digital health players are available. However, in many disease areas, these remain elusive and also may have other strategic priorities. A third myth is digital health will never make, will never make any money. <laughs> um, well, it's certainly fair to acknowledge that it will take time for digital health companies to start generating revenue, or at least the kinds of revenue that pharma is taking for granted when it comes to medicine blockbusters. However, specifically in the area of, medic of regulated medical software, we see clear reasons to believe that eventually such products will be able to bring in significant uh, profits. They mentioned pair therapeutics which went public in 2021 at a valuation of 1.6 billion and sells its three month course of its insomnia app for $899. Wow. So that's, that's pretty, that's pretty high, I would say, but great. That's great for them. I, I would lose sleep over that. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I, I guess I get, uh, thanks. Thanks for this article. I didn't actually read it, but I've got, I've, I've got some, some thoughts on it like obviously each pharma company has been in competition with one another for irons of years right tens and tens and decades and so they have a remit to innovate selectively um and i think that's that's the problem i think blockchain will enable transparency and interoperability and I think collaboration is the key. I think if you can collaborate internally within your industry and externally and deliver one solution for patients, I think digital health isn't supposed to really make, make money, in, in my opinion. It's supposed to better patients' lives and have them feeling more empowered about their own data and as well as the information associated with that pharmaceutical ingredient. So I think having an industry-wide solution for some of these problems is, is probably the first step. And then the next step is endorsement, regulatory compliance internally within the company. So I, I think these are definitely the stereotypes that have been within big pharma and digital health for the last decade or so. But I think blockchain isn't the silver bullet to kind of fix and cure every single digital health problem, but it's an enabler for interoperability. And, and this, this whole kind of, I guess, collaborative approach, it, it basically, you might be cutting basically up. means that a rising tide lifts. All. I think we're just on a cusp of, oh, sorry. I think we're just on a cusp of kind of. We're on the cusp of. Tackling these, these problems. Sorry okay. if I cut up, Ray. No worries. Um, you just, last thing so I, I heard I, is you're on the I, cusp of tackling I think these problems. I, yeah, I think yeah, blockchain is at the cusp of kind of raising these issues and, and tackling tackling these issues, yeah, tackling the problems at them. Good comments. Agreed. Thank you. And 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 change management is impossible at massive organizations. Not impossible, but it's so hard to drive right. engagement, right? So that's that's another barrier as well. Right. And blockchain is more than just a technology solution, too. You have to involve your 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 financial it's, it's a, team, your it, marketing teams. There's, there's a lot um, about this that. It, it, it's, it's more, I think personally, it's more cultural mm -hmm. rather than technological. Um, and that paradigm shift in having a disruptive technology, people don't like change, right? So these are the kind of 
day-to-day kind of problems i guess big farmers are facing absolutely thanks for sharing that uh the fourth myth here actually is tech companies are so much better at this so this is what the farmers believe and I mean, it's important to note that such challenges are not a phenomenon exclusive to digital health, but instead extend to any tech powered movement seeking to disrupt established industries. Um, So yeah, it talks about unicorns and Uber. Uh, We in pharma, it says, have to adjust our expectations that disrupting an industry as regulated, fragmented, and sensitive as healthcare will take time. We also need to recognize that the high barriers to entry are actually a good thing. Much like in pharma, for those that persevere, blue ocean markets await with lower levels of competition and near infinite potential. Stamina, however, is of the essence. What a sentence. Uh, Yeah, I I can't argue with that. (laughs) And finally, it mentions the truth, right? This is the one truth and the other others were myths. It's still going to take a lot more time, funds, and effort. Don't we know that? Uh, It mentions here, in Germany, the pioneering reimbursement pathway for digital health products is showing early promise and offers a blueprint for other nations. In one year, the 20 approved solutions were prescribed 50,000 times and 13 million euro were reimbursed by insurers. Wow. Okay. Didn't know... Germany's um, progress there. So that's good to know. Um, It also mentions opting out of digital disruption is not an option. Our choice is in how to shape it. So, you know, everyone has to be part of this digital disruption. It's just a matter of how we want it to look moving forward. Um, Yeah, so I thought this was a really interesting article. Feel free to read through it in full. Um, Any comments on this from any of the pharma players in, in this uh, meeting? Okay. So those are the news articles I found. There are three other ed- educational nuggets that are a bit longer maybe and um, sort of as a broader topic. Here, the first one is an HBR, Harvard Business Review article on what a DAO can and can't do. This goes into depth about what a DAO is, how they're built, and different structures and different examples of decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, they don't specifically focus on healthcare only. That's it's pretty wide ranging, but I think it's pretty interesting to see what Harvard Business Review thinks about DAOs and, and that it is you know gaining traction. You know they talk about in July 2021, Wyoming became the first state in the country to explicitly codify rules around DAOs wishing to become domiciled in that jurisdiction. So, you know, talk about city DAO in that case. There's a lot of interesting examples in this. So, yeah, feel free to check that out. Uh, Ray, is Wyoming considered a a state that is kind of blockchain kind of friendly for development and things like this? Because I think I've seen quite a lot of things coming out of there. So is, is it going to be easier to, to develop there, I guess? Yes, it is actually. So Wyoming has been one of the more friendly states for crypto and, and blockchain in general. And I can read a little bit more here. Um, this rule change means that DAOs and Wyoming's are considered a distinct form of limited liability company, which grants them a legal wow. personality and confers a wide range of rights, such as limited liability for members. Okay. Um, so yeah, they're definitely one of the positive forward-looking states in the U.S. And and this is Wendy, I can add to that too. So uh, blockchain has been adopted even at the government level for the state of Wyoming. It's uh, Colorado's neighbor to the north. And so we we often have a mix of groups and individuals who are blockchain enthusiasts. Uh, So uh, the state of Wyoming put all of its land records on a blockchain. I wanna say it was even two years ago. And uh, four years ago, they even started voting uh, on a blockchain. And two years ago, they had widespread, uh, so it was kind of pilot four years ago and two years ago was widespread voting on a blockchain. So Wyoming is very progressive and hopes to attract a lot of blockchain business. 
Wow, thanks for sharing that, Lenny. Thank you. People there, but the whole state is what a half a million people or something. It's uh, it's a small like a population. Small. I don't know what the population is, and it's not progressive for most other things. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. But they are trying to be a leader in blockchain progress. Good for them. Illinois was uh, also had, which is a very populous state by comparison was taking a lead in codifying um, not so much DAOs, but uh, various mechanics around blockchain. Has anyone heard anything about that lately? I haven't, but that's interesting. I'll look into that. Illinois, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, Chicago is the hmm. kind of the center of a lot of attention right now. In the Midwest, and that you know they're they're pro choice, and it's just a lot. There's a lot going on in Illinois by comparison. It's many millions of people. <laughs> yeah, no, that's it's definitely a much bigger state uh, in terms of population for sure. Um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna continue into our educational nuggets here. The next one was is Episode 95, actually, of my podcast. If you don't know, I have a podcast called Health Unchained. I've been interviewing people in the blockchain and healthcare space for a couple of years now, actually, sort of like part-time as a hobby. But um, the latest one was with Talisha Shine, who's been active as a consultant in the space for some time now. And she also founded the Black Blockchain Consultants Group. Um, so... Yeah, I encourage anyone who's interested, check that out. Um, I did see a, a comment, I think, by James. Yeah, so that's this is one podcast I would recommend. There's many others that are in the blockchain space and crypto for sure, um, but I haven't seen any that are specifically focused on blockchain and healthcare. So No, no thank you. I have a flight this afternoon, and I'm going to enjoy your podcast uh, while I'm traveling. Thank you. Awesome. Crazy. I love that. Crazy always the best thank you guys appreciate it uh and if you have feedback questions i'm always i was here the next there's another podcast actually which i thought was interesting it's on supply chain um and it's talking about you know is healthcare catching up to blockchain specifically in drug supply chain so it's a short it's like 16 minute podcast um worth checking out too it was, I think, let's see. Um, on this episode, we traced the progress of blockchain and healthcare with the help of Afruz Moatari Kazaruni. Hope I said that right. Assistant Professor of Operations Management at Widener University in Chester, Pennsylvania. So that's another one. I'm sure there's many others, but that's what I caught in my research. Um, and those are all the articles I had prepared. There was someone who sent me an email this week and uh, you know, for the meeting, and he just wanted to highlight this. I don't think they're on now, but uh, this article about long COVID syndrome and using AI to advance the understanding of long COVID. So about, it's about how we can take many data, data sets and data pieces um, in medical records and public data too, to understand how long how long COVID is impacting our population. So it would be great that this is, would be done in a way that's privacy preserving for individuals and we're not revealing everything. But um, yeah, I haven't looked too much into this, but I left it here for anyone who might be interested. Um, and yeah, that's, that's all I had prepared for today. But if there's any discussion points you guys would like to chat about, happy to do so. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Anyone have any interesting announcements, articles they, they found over the last couple of weeks? So, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm trying to find another good blockchain course another maybe eight to 12 weeks and I just wanted to get your guys opinion 
on which ones do you think are worth worth doing at a like an uh, an intermediate level i mean i've i've done some of the basic ones but i just saw uh, it's quite cool at the the msc in digital currencies at the university of nicosia in cyprus um coinbase scholars are actually sponsoring that 100 percent if you can apply to do it it's like ten thousand dollars so that's that's something cool that i found but yeah i'm just I've seen one at MIT. I've seen one at Harvard Business, and I just wanted to like get get a consensus where where you think would be good to kind of apply. Hi, Kerry. This is Wendy Charles, and I can answer that question um, with one example. Um, the University of California, San Diego offers a blockchain healthcare certificate course. It is virtual. It is, um, I think, it's self paced. Uh, I was actually one of the lecturers, so that's why I know about it. And it, uh, they have different experts from blockchain and healthcare around the world um, teach different segments. And uh, it's very reasonably priced. Um, so that might be an option where you can get some quality education that's been vetted. Um, I know from my process, my lecture, um, I received a lot of feedback about how the or organizers wanted me to tweak certain things. So I felt like it wasn't just kind of a free for all for lectures. There was um, a lot of meaningful content uh, and oversight put into it to make sure that it's very high quality. And it receives some um, official designation. Uh, you actually get a certificate of completion from a university. So uh, that, that might be worthwhile to look into. Awesome. Yeah, if you could like maybe ping me or whack it in a chat. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to see if I can. It's often hard to find, but I will. Don't worry. If, <laughs> whenever, if whenever, whenever. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So I'm, I'm interested in those also. I just did an internet search and, uh, and I did indeed find that course, Wendy. Thank you. Uh, I've also been looking into those courses. I went through one at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, and I found that one to to be helpful. I mean, it had a bit. It wasn't the introductory. It had some introductory stuff, but then uh, uh, it had some some really good additional information, a bit more intermediate. Uh, and then I'm also looking at one that's going to start in September uh, at Duke. Yeah, I, I had taken several online courses about blockchain and healthcare, and I found them to be. It wasn't just that they were outdated, but the people who delivered the content didn't actually work in blockchain. And so they spoke a lot about theory, but they didn't talk about how messy the actual production and design is and how difficult it is to meet the regulations in the technology itself. And so I, I found them to be lacking because the, the people just didn't have the breadth of knowledge about what the practical and realistic implementations look like. Yeah, that's what I'm finding. Like some of the ones that I'm looking at, they're, they're, quite, they're quite superficial and they cover a, a broad range of topics, whereas I want something quite juicy and quite meaty to kind of, uh, kind of learn from, I guess. But yeah, no, um, thanks, thanks for sharing, everyone. Yeah, you make a good point, Wendy, that a lot of these courses might be a little outdated, especially because the industry is moving so quickly. Um, and if it would be helpful for you guys, I would love to even include somewhere in our Confluence page, like a list of courses, maybe, maybe like review them even somehow. Would that be something that would be helpful for everyone here? Absolutely. I would love that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, these cool. the members would love that. Okay, okay. Yeah. Like I'm going to make me, a note of that. Like for me, I'm actually, you know, looking at introductory ones. My background is in healthcare, um, but I want to learn a lot more. And one of the things that I've been looking at is that all the courses, like um, Karit said, and and Wendy, they are they're not about the practice. They're not about you know its concepts and things. But you know, how do you apply it? You know, how do you get in? into a project so so that's one of the things that i've been looking at and i cannot find anything that is not just theoretical or that is also not up to date agreed so that would be great if you know if there is a list of things that you actually that you guys actually recommend because when you make this kind of investment you want to make sure that you get something out of it exactly and, and quite honestly, with my background in health information technology, and James, my PhD is in health information technology. <laughs> uh, 
I worked, uh, I worked for many years in healthcare environments. And so when we as like a healthcare special interest group, we talk about healthcare, we always have to put our technology into the ecosystem of how healthcare is actually delivered. And what systems do they already have? And how do we integrate blockchain with their existing system? Now, as we're aware, there are just detailed risk assessments, there are a conservative environment, there are tremendous regulations, and so this is part of the context that needs to be in any course as well, and that we have to have um, kind of a, a cautious approach about how we, we think about this information in that healthcare ecosystem. And the biggest complaint that I have with some of the course materials thus far is that <clears throat> they've been delivered by people who didn't work in healthcare environments. And they talk a lot about theory, but they just don't understand, like, how would this compare with what type of uh, security is already in an EHR? Or some people say, oh, you need to verify that doctors aren't falsifying medical records. And it's like, wait a minute. You know, how many doctors are going to jeopardize their medical licenses and harm patients? Um, and how is this different than the audit trail that's actually much more in an EHR that's actually much more sophisticated than what a blockchain offers? So it's um, having the right perspective in the right context. And, and maybe we need to develop a course because we have more expertise in this group <laughs> than many organizations offer that offer courses. And that I think that there are so many things within healthcare that people don't think about. And, you know, my, my background is in a lot of different things from hospital to insurance, to employers, to patients. So my, my experience is very well-rounded. And, you know, I have a lot of ideas of things that could be done, but the courses that are out there, I just don't see how they can be implemented in things that are actually really needed and they would be actually very you know in the in the financial part would would be very profitable um and in, to include you know savings for the for the employer knowledge for the patient as well as a lot of savings, you know, through the insurance companies. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a, there is a lot of things that could be done. I just don't see, and I cannot find some, you know, a course or something that actually I can say, yeah, I can use this. And I have some friends that have gotten their, um, their masters in, in healthcare informatics. And they, they tell me, I've gone back to clinical because there is no, I can use this thing. I can't, you know, there is, I mean, I make more money <laughs> actually as a practitioner than going into tech in this area. So it would be great, yeah, if we have a list of actually good courses or create something that actually is practical and that you can apply. Yeah. And thanks for sharing that, everybody. I will definitely look for a list. And if there isn't one, I'll try to make a list for us as well. And for the community, I think that I'm glad you mentioned that. I didn't know that was a problem until now. So um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm in Seattle okay. and actually after the, pan, uh, pan, uh, after the pandemic, um, we had a really good group for um, entrepreneurs for healthcare. And that kind of fizzled out through, you know, the years because, you know, we used to get together. We had a place where we did, you know, um, interviews and we did collaborations and things like that. And that is no longer around. They're changing it because it didn't, you know, pe people couldn't get together and as doing Zoom meetings kind of, I don't know, it, it just kind of fizzled out. Um, but there is a lot of, here in Seattle, there is a lot of um, interest, you know, and into, into uh, healthcare and, and um, innovation. And Alicia, I'm so glad that you raised this issue too, because we, we hear a lot of ignorance on international committees that we're on and sometimes at conferences. For example, last year, I was on a panel 
where the chair of the panel was from John Hopkins, promoted himself as a blockchain healthcare expert. And he was talking about how problematic it is for patients to do mining and keep a crypto wallet in order to interact with their health record. And I was like, what planet are you on? This is not how we do things for blockchain and healthcare. And um, it was really, really disappointing for him to talk about the use of public blockchains for as the only mechanism for dealing with healthcare. And it's like, please, you know, there has been. We've made but but the, thing, the, the thing is, though, Wendy, people will hear that and they will, will remember it. And that's the, that's the stuff that we need I to kind know. of avoid doing. That's crazy. And, that the, and, I, and I think that the other thing is that when you look about even global, because I have participated in a lot of, you know, through the pandemic and all that, we, I participate in a lot of global meetings. And you have to realize that countries are not the same. And people do not deal with healthcare the same way in the United States than in the UK or any other place. So it, it's kind of like you have to focus on what is it that you want to do for a certain area and make it happen. And it might be that some of that would work in another country, but there are a lot of, you know, the, the systems are totally different. So you have to think about how, you know, an EMR works in England or in Italy or whatever, or in the United States. So I, I think that there, there is so much to actually figure out what problem you wanna solve and actually focus on, on that. And then from there, see what could be extrapolated into other places. Alicia, thank you for that. Yeah, and I agree with all of you on um, education needs to keep happening basically and good education particularly and i think that's this is part of it i want to thank you all for for joining today and for uh continuing to support this for the new members and old really appreciate it thanks for joining and we'll see you june 22nd in two weeks same time thank you all thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.